Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 16. Today, my guest is Alex Boone. Alex is an artist and nature writer from the UK whose work is deeply rooted in the landscape around him in East Devon. His connection and passion for nature comes through in each drawing and each journal page. Thank you so much for being here. I'm very happy to speak with you today. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's really exciting. It's the first time I've been recorded like this. So, yeah. <laughs> That's great. So you've been doing some um, self-recording on Instagram, haven't you? You've been putting yeah. yourself out there in a different way lately. Yes. Well, um, during your um, nature journaling week, I recorded some sort of tutorial videos and things, and that was the first yeah. time I'd done that as well. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So but just getting they were so to... well received. Yeah, they were. Yeah, I was quite surprised by that, actually. Um, I don't have proper equipment. I don't have a proper yeah. studio space at the moment. So, you know, it's just me on f- from my front room. <laughs> and um, yeah. it still went down really well. So that's really good. I love that, actually, about the way the world is going. Everyone's got some sort of device in their pocket that can record them. And people are. it's more accessible now. People can be making content in a different way that they haven't done before. Yeah, it's an amazing kind of opportunity that we have really. We've got this connectivity that we'd never had before, so it's pretty amazing. Things that can be done with it are are pretty great. I'm really interested to talk about nature connection in the beginning. What was your childhood connection with nature like? Well, um, yeah, there was was quite a lot. Um, I grew up in a a village, um, in a sort of typical English village really, um, and we had we had five oak trees in our back garden, so you know they were just full of bird life. They were we had squirrels running around in the garden, um, foxes and badgers in the garden. We had pretty much everything. We were very lucky. Um, wow! And there were all these fields behind our house, the houses as well. Um, and I went to a school that was pretty much on the opposite side of the fields. So instead of um, going round the road like I was supposed to, I just hopped the fences and went straight across the fields to school <laughs> and back again the other way. Um, so I always kind of had that connection, you know, with the, the natural world. And I, I feel very lucky to have had that, really. Mm. Uh, I was a very horsey person growing up as well. And so I was always down with the horses, going out riding on the, the common. So it was always quite close to my heart, really. Mm. I was a horsey kid as well. <laughs> very, 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 uh, I don't know. There's something about horses, isn't there? I, I, don't, I was going to say something profound and I couldn't think of something. <laughs> but horses are just amazing, aren't they? They can, you know, they, they can take you somewhere. You kind of, when you feel like you yeah. get on a horse, you're kind of, it gives you another dimension to, as opposed to just walking somewhere. Yes. I, I love the way they smell as well. And they, Me you know, too. Just, they're just <laughs> lovely. I, I kind of really miss horses. I haven't had one for a long time. But, yeah. yeah, when I was a little girl, I wanted a horse with every cell in my body <laughs> and I used to take every opportunity to ride and I loved the smell of horses so much that I would take an old T-shirt and I would put it under the saddle blanket when I got a chance (laughs) to ride someone else's horse and I would get my T-shirt all covered in horse, sweaty horse smell (laughs) and then I would take this sweaty T-shirt to bed with me and dream about horses. (laughs) Now, some people would say that's a weird kid, but I completely understand. (laughs) I used to take the, the horse's tack home with me. And because it was yes. my horse when, well, when I was a bit older, I got my own pony and I used to just sit it in the, by the radiator. So the room would smell of horse and my parents would complain, you know, the room smells yes. of horses. But, uh, I, don't know. I get it. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> and tell me about how you came to nature journaling from there, from a childhood in nature. How did you come to then be a nature journaler? Um, 
I don't know exactly when that started because I used to do lots of drawings. I didn't know it was nature journaling. Mm. Like I draw horses. I drew horses a lot when I was growing up. And then I kind of branched out into other animals. Um, I, I read a lot of books like, um, you know, The Animals of Farthing Wood by Colin Dan. I don't know if you know mm. that one. I don't know it, but it sounds beautiful. It's, it is beautiful, beautiful story. Um, and Watership Down, of course, very similar mm. kind of idea. I read all of these types of books and they got me inspired to start drawing animals. Um, but I didn't, I didn't call it nature journaling because I didn't know what that was. Yes. Um, but at, at some point, I think in my teenage years, I found um, a copy of the Country Diary of an Edwardian Lady in my, yes. among my grand's things. And <laughs> she said that I could have that book. You know, she said, oh, yeah, you clearly like that. You can have it. Um, and that kind of just stayed with me. Like, I didn't mm. immediately start journaling, but I was painting a lot and drawing. Um, I went off to art school, but that didn't last very long. <laughs> I was there about three months. I think, in the end. Um, I'm an art school dropout too, actually. <laughs> I only lasted a couple of weeks. <laughs> the course wasn't right for me. Yeah, so how here. did you feel when you are there? The course just wasn't right? Yes, it was... Um, I like to draw things as they were, you know. I, I yeah. like to... Exp- I like to get really into stuff, you know, like see mm. it, it as it is. And I was on an illustration course and they didn't want me to do that and I couldn't understand why. What did they want you to do? They, this, they were so sort of everything had to be really expressive okay and yeah. they were like oh how do you feel you need to show how you feel in your work and mm. I was like oh, it's not really about how I feel it's about how mm. that looks and like, you mm-hmm. know I think I probably should have been on some sort of natural history illustration course mm. or something I was probably I just chose the wrong thing and yeah. there were these criticism groups and you know we'd all sit and look at each other's work <laughs> and everyone had done all this really crazy abstract kind of things very beautiful but there was nothing like mine and they were yeah. kind of clubbed together and there was nothing malicious about it but I just really felt in the wrong in the wrong place you know yes yes when I was at art school they told me that the illustrator who did Ren and Stimpy is more relevant than Leonardo da Vinci and I said, <laughs> yeah, this isn't really my scene <laughs> Yeah, they can be a bit like that. I think it's just a sort of arty, arty thing. Yeah. And I think, you know, I sometimes think if I picked the right course, I could have gone yeah. further, quicker. But So then you so you ditched that, and then, and then what? You just kept doing it for yourself? Yeah, I did it for myself. Um, mm. I went and uh, sort of retook another um, A-level in environmental mm. sciences and then went off and became a scientist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, took a different track from that point but I never really stopped doing art I just did it Mm. for myself Mm. and it wasn't until about eight or nine years after that and when we we moved to Devon that I started properly nature journaling and I thought okay I'm going to you know put words to drawings and that's what Mm. I've been doing ever since. And your work is really rooted in place like you have this ongoing project that you call Fragments, which is about all about exploring the landscape and the wildlife in East Devon and West Dorset. I'd love to talk a little bit about this, about developing a deep connection with one place, with with your place in this world. Yeah, that that kind of just it came from the nature journaling that idea, mm. and. Like I've been keeping this nature journal that you can see on Instagram, my sort of main nature journal. But in there, I kind of just sort of follow my days along a little bit where I've been. But the Fragments project idea was to try and develop that further into a real expression of this particular area, its history, Mm. what we can find here right now. Because I have a great love for this part of the world. Um, We used to come here on holiday ever since I was a little kid. And uh, I sort of decided that when we could go anywhere, uh, that we'd land here at some point, and that that's what ended up happening. So it was kind of, it started out just trying to explore all of those places I remember from when I was young, get that down into some words that are a little bit more... Because my nature journal is kind of like a diary. Mm. The Fragments Project is more like written observation. Um, from 
actually written in the place. So I take notebooks out with mm. me and I sit in a place and I write about what I see. And sometimes I draw, sometimes I write. It depends on the day. But I'm hoping to collate that into a a book or some, some mm. description. <laughs> It makes a big difference to write in place, doesn't it? It, it does. Something comes out of you that can't come out when you're just thinking about a place, but you're sitting um, away from it. Yes, definitely. And I'm finding that right now because I'm writing up my notes at the moment. Mm. Um, but there's something very magical about having the words that you wrote in that place can bring back memories so vivid that you can then draw on that to write more. But if I yes. tr if I just took a few photos and, and then came back and sat at the computer, that wouldn't be there. Yes, 100%. It's incredible looking back through old uh, diaries or journals or writing, how much can come back up, how much memory is stored there. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful part of this exercise, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yesterday I was writing about... I think it was February uh, this year and I was writing about I'd gotten out of the car and I'd gone and sat on this we have these great big old banks um, in this part of the world that are really really ancient boundaries of, of fields and they have these enormous beech trees that are just literally growing out of this bank and the roots are you can see the roots growing all along the sides of the bank wow. it's all this old moss that's piled right up high just on the top and I was sat on there and I was having my lunch and I've got all of these words about, you know, what it felt like to be there. And I was typing that up and I just had this picture in my head, you know, of, of, of that particular moment. And it's like we lose so much of our lives, you know, like the time I spend in my other job, I'm sat in front of a computer and I edit all of, all of these scientific papers. But I can't tell you a word of what they were about, <laughs> Yes, you know, because I just get through so, so many of them. And I think we lose a lot of our lives in this way. You know, we just we plug into something. Yeah. Um, so I find it really, really special when I can call up a memory that vivid like that. It's, it's a really, really wonderful thing to be able to experience. Yeah, and what a joy and treasure it's going to be in years to come, like two decades down the line when you revisit these things and they're still there just as fresh as any as the other day in, in your memory. It's going to be amazing. Yes, and I think, you know, if we can encourage more people to do this, that is where one of the greatest benefit lies, really, mm -hmm. is in getting people to, when they're outside, to spend more time out there observing so that when they want to get, you know, when they want to come back to a happier time, mm -hmm. they've got a, yeah. a record of it that they can they draw upon, you know, to come back to it. There's so much power in that, I think. Yeah, I agree. So you've said before that you have some different types of journals, that you have one that's like a diary, one that's like a, a perpetual journal, and yeah. one that's like a field sketchbook. I'd love yes. to hear you talk about your different types of journals that you keep. Yeah, it's um, it's quite odd because I, I would also add the written journals in there as well, mm -hmm. my, my sort of field written books. So there's probably four but they all have mm -hmm. a really different purpose. So what I'm trying to achieve with each of them is completely different. That's why I need so many different books. Yeah. <laughs> to sort of separate them out a little bit. Um, the main journal is the very, very precise um, journal where I, I kind of play with composition. I'm really interested in how you blend images together. So on that one, I, I work from photographs and other observations from the field. Um, the Perpetual Journal has a completely different idea about it. And I know that quite a few people on Instagram will know um, Laura Gastinger, yes. um, an amazing botanical illustrator who um, got this idea out there. And in this journal, you write the, instead of going sort of consecutively, chronologically through time, you write a date range in the top of each page. And then you come back to that particular date each year and you, you can see how the seasons, you know, how things vary year by year. Um, different, you know, when, say, an individual plant, maybe it comes out at a different time each year. Yeah, um, it's such a genius that. idea, isn't it? It's brilliant. <laughs> She's so, been keeping hers for so many years on the same page, and it's just such a... It's stunning. It's yeah. such an inspiration. 
Mm. And I think to have a record like that in different parts of the world as a community, mm. we've, we've created something pretty amazing if we keep on going with it. Yes. Yeah. That, that idea that a nature journal is capturing local knowledge. I was talking to another guest uh, a few couple of weeks ago about how valuable that is to capture local knowledge because we no longer have this connection with elders and passing down local knowledge yes. in the same way that we did in the past. And so this document these documents are going to be super valuable i think yeah i hope so and i think it's great that we can keep a digital record of them and a physical record in these times yeah and share them in a community so people know about them you're right um yeah so going back to the other journals the two field books there's the the written one and the the drawn one that that one is a lot more about playing with techniques doing quick drawings in place mm. And just, it's it's very playful. Sometimes I'm a little scared of show, sharing those ones on Instagram because I know that they're not polished and, they're, you know, we Isn't all have funny? this fear. Yeah, we have this fear. I know, I do feel, I feel that too. <laughs> it's a shame, but I feel that too. <laughs> yes, but it's I great think... to have though these, these places where, like, just dumping it down and experimenting, they're really yeah. valuable as well. I think it's quite important. I, I think we're... We kind of it's difficult with Instagram because you're sucked mm. into this idea of branding. Your Instagram has yes. to have a brand, so everything fits together. But when you do a lot of different things that are all for different purposes mm. and they don't all quite they have a, a common theme, but they're not a brand at all. Mm. It's it's hard not to get pulled into that sometimes. I think. Yeah. So you mentioned. I've heard you talk about the difference between nature journals and country diary sketchbook, and I'm wondering if the one you'd said where you're blending everything together on one page, if that's what you would say is a country diary sketchbook. Yeah, I think that's following the sort of the old uh, traditional idea, like Edith Holden's work. Yeah. Um, there's also there's a, a local diarist, and unfortunately I can't remember her name, Um but she, but she was a watercolorist in the seventies and did all mm -hmm. of these drawings, sort of paintings and drawings of this area and kept her diary, um, mm. and that really inspired me as well. So it's, it's nice to know that this place has been explored in that way yes. before, and that there's a sort of legacy of it. Um, and you get a lot in the newspapers. I don't know if you do over in Australia. You get a lot of sort of articles that are country diary based. We, I don't, I don't know. I'm not a big newspaper person, but um, I haven't seen anything like that. I think the sort of naturalist, natural history uh, connection is stronger in the UK. I'm not sure. I, I have lived in the UK before and I got this idea that natural history as a part of normal life is, is bigger there. I'm not sure. I think in some ways it is, but I think it's very rose-tinted. Mm. But you okay. get a lot in the um, you get some in the no local newspapers. You get the Guardian has like, a very good country diary web page that you can look at, okay. and I found all of that very inspiring. But mm. um, yeah, like I say, a, a lot of that I do think well, it's quite rose tinted the British perception of the countryside, and there's a sort of a more radical environmentalist movement that's building up here that's starting to question some of these ideas of um, the great British countryside and what that really means. Um, do you mean like there's more being lost than people are admitting? What do you, when you say it's rose-tinted, what do you mean? I think, yeah, for example, like um, somewhere like the Lake District, mm -hmm. which is very, very beautiful and very, very aesthetic, but also very, very human. Mm. Um, and we sort of, we like these chocolate boxy British villages that are okay. seeped in a sort of a colonial history um, and aren't really natural. You, you know, mm. you can you can love um, farmland, for example, but you can then think that wildflowers are weeds and insects are pests yeah. um, and forests are plantations. Mm. And I think a lot of the picture that we have in the UK of the British countryside is not a wild space and it's not necessarily for nature. But I think that there's a movement that wants to change some of these ideas in the UK. Um, and I think that nature journaling could be an expression of activism in that sense. Mm. 
which I'm really, really interested in now. I'm, I'm really mm. thinking of ways that we can take the rose-tinted glass, glasses off and look at the damage that's starting to happen and yeah. want to love and protect what we have instead of kind of squash it. Mm. <laughs> I think that's that's one become, as I've been doing this, this has become increasingly important to me. Yes. One thing I loved about connecting with nature and natural spaces in the UK was the right of way that you can just walk through um that you can just walk through paddocks and farmland and that's not really like that here in Australia it's it's not really like that here either to be honest okay <laughs> it's you have there are rights of way and there are footpaths and we've got a lot of them um mm. but we've lost a lot of them as well okay um Scotland has this amazing um right of access where mm. land can be privately owned, but people have the right to walk across the land and mm. to use it um, for for whatever, recreationally, wild camping, biking, and so on. But they have, it's rooted in a kind of responsible use of the countryside and people can actually get yeah. out and see the countryside and therefore they um, they respect it. Yes. And I think here in England, we do have a lot of right of way, but we also well, we don't have access to 90% of the countryside. Mm. We don't, we're not allowed to walk around the edge of a, of a cultivated field because that is private land. Okay. So it's kind of, yeah, we do have access, but we don't have enough of it. Mm, I think mm. for, for the population that we have in England, I don't think we have enough access to the countryside, especially around cities and urban areas, other urban areas. Something special about your area is just the depth, the literal depth of history that you can just see history melting into the earth. Like you, you can scratch the top of the soil and you're going to find something from a Viking or it, it's just incredible that the level of history where you are. Yeah, it, it is. And actually on the hill opposite to us, we know that there is a, um, a Iron Age hill fort up there. So I'm, um, you know, every morning I wake up and I look at a hill, what was a hill fort. And um, the other amazing thing that we have here is going back even beyond human history is we have the oh. um, the Jurassic Coast here, which is a, a World Heritage yes. Site. Yeah, can you talk about that? Are you close to that? Yes, very close. Um, we're in a little town called Seaton, which is right on in the southwest, um, south coast of the UK. And it's just on the edge of this coastline. And it's, it's quite fascinating because if you go west, you've got the red cliffs and sort of this red sandstone. Here in Seaton, we have white cliffs just like Dover, you know, the famous white mm. cliffs of Dover. We have that here. And then if you continue east, you come into all of these Jurassic shells and you've got enormous ammonites and various other fossils. You can find, I found um, teeth, fish teeth down there. Um, oh, wow. bits of fossilised wood, you, you get all sorts. It's, it's fascinating. Um, when you come to the next town along, which is called Lyme Regis, which has an incredible history to it, um, it's quite a feminist history as well, which is, is really interesting. One of the first um, paleontologists made her discoveries there at Lyme Regis. Um, wow. On the coast there, um, if you, it's the undercliffs, um, nature reserve that you come from our town you walk through that nature reserve and you come to Lyme Regis you can come down onto the beach and at low tide there's a platform stretching right out to sea and it's it's pretty huge you know, it's football pitch size and you can get ammonites on there that are about a metre no. you know, they are enormous and you can just stand among them it's a wonderful place really that's incredible isn't it amazing to stand in a place and just feel its history, just feel it seeping into your, yeah. It's, I, I find it quite sad, actually, because a lot of people come to Lyme Regis. Um, it's a very sort of popular tourist town, but because mm. they don't want to walk, a lot of people are quite lazy in this country. They don't want to walk. They don't want to walk to the end of the beach, but if they did walk <laughs> to the end of the beach, that's what they'd find. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's missing out, isn't it? <laughs> it's really missing out. Look, and they go and park their kids on the sandy beach and they stay there all day and you're just like, just go over there, go and have a look, see what you can see. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm interested to talk about your writing because the writing on your blog is very literary and I, I can tell that you're a writer as much as an artist and 
I'd love to talk about nature writing. What does nature writing mean to you? I think nature writing is a, a magnificent genre mm. that has come. It, it sort of it. It was something that was really, really important in in the UK um, pre Victorian times. And that's mm. and then the industrial revolution sort of came along and squashed it a little bit. And you just have a few a few writers between you know that that's over that sort of period and up to the world wars but more recently there's just been this explosion of it and where it's become extremely popular in the UK really it, it really is it's it's wonderful and um, there's there's bookshops springing up that are nature writing bookshops here and I've visited a few wow. of them and they are just wonderful oh. so there's just this sort of movement of writing about nature that has inspired me so much and there's some fantastic writers who are your favorites who are your inspirations um robert mcfarlane yes he's my favorite nature writer (laughs) it's the way he spins words together i just it's just incredible every every Mm. time like sometimes i read a few paragraphs and then i have to put the book down and think about it and there's Mm. few writers Mm -mm. that that do that and also Roger Deakin and Richard Maybe going back a little bit more. Um, one of my favourite writers of all time is Flora Thompson, who most people know um, because she wrote this book called Lock, Rise to Candleford, which is actually a trilogy of, of stories um, recounting her growing up in the Victorian period, but they were written in about 1930s, 1940s. Um, but she also was a really prolific nature writer and she wrote all of these um, short pieces of nature writing for a um, publication called The Catholic Fireside. And it's so little known now. There's one collection of, of, of that's, I think it was either self-published or for a small publisher. They are just wonderful, wonderful bits of writing. And I do sometimes wonder whether she's just been underrated because she's a female writer. Okay, um, yeah. And I, you know, I think that's awful, but... It, it just seems I don't know why she's underrated because mm. these these nature papers if people would read them if they'd get out there I think that they'd be much more well loved on the sort of Edith Holden level mm. um, and it's, it's very interesting because she writes a lot about um, some of the changes that were happening in the 1920s sort of the increased mechanization of farming um, sort of bit of housing development creeping in mm. and what happened during the war with um, some of the heathland that she was by uh, lived by being used as uh, sort of training areas and it's really really interesting historical writing as well it can be intertwined kind of nature writing and history and there's something super powerful in that I, I believe yeah definitely I, I don't think you can especially somewhere like the UK where we, we've got a high population, reasonably high population density, and a, like you said, a long history of um, mm. land management. I don't think you can really disentangle nature from humanity yes. in the way that we often try to. And I think that that's kind of a trap that can, you can get full, sort of fall into mm. where you think that things are separate yes. when really we're affecting it and it's affecting us. Yeah, and um, Robert McFarlane does that so well, weaving humanity and nature. And I've just picked up his new book, Underland. Have you read it yet? I have, yes. It's my favourite one. Shockingly beautiful on the first pages. Oh, my goodness, I'm so excited about it. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, you're lucky reading it for the first time. (laughs) Enjoy it. (laughs) (laughs) So yoga and meditation are a big part of your life, and I'm interested in your thoughts on how being in nature in the present moment can be its own form of moving meditation. Yeah, I think it, the key word is moving in, in, in many ways. Mm. Um, a lot of the time, I sometimes even find myself falling into the trap. You can be walking while you're thinking about something else. Yes. And then you you look up, you're like, oh, I'm here. Well, how did I get here then? Um, yeah. Walking meditation is a, an amazing way to observe the land around you. If you try and keep focused on how things change with every step, what have I, what have I just noticed? What have I just spotted? Mm. What's What sounds can I hear? Um, I actually find that a lot more powerful than sitting meditation most of the time. Um, I go on, out on retreats. Obviously, coronavirus has stopped that for, mm. for now. Um, 
And so I go to this place about an, an hour's drive from us in near the edges of Dartmoor. Um, and we sit in a meditation hall. And quite often I leave the meditation hall because I'd rather sit outside and you'd be yeah. perfectly allowed to do this. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's that, yes, that sitting in nature and not having to be anywhere or do anything else and trying to see and see things that you wouldn't have noticed if you'd been thinking about other things. Mm. And I think some of my most profound sort of moments of just realising things that are really important to me have been sitting out doing that either on retreat or, or otherwise. I mean, the the Buddha himself found enlightenment, according to legend, underneath the Bodhi tree. Mm-hmm. And he sat in nature for months, months, years, finding, seeking. And it was in nature that he found enlightenment. I don't think by cutting ourselves off from it, we're, we're ever going to find enlightenment either. Um, yeah. It's a yeah. it's a heart it's a completely heart opening experience, isn't it? When you're just sitting and observing, taking it into yourself in a in a soul way. Yeah, and I I think that if if you're a nature journaler, and you go out to a place and you want to you know, do a page or do some writing or drawing, there's something so valuable in just saying, "Well, for five minutes, I'm not going to write. I'm not yes. going to try and do anything. I'm going to sit here." And I'm going to see what there is. And you might spot something to draw that you hadn't seen when you first arrived. You know, it's all about that, that taking the time to see the whole picture of what in that landscape that you're in. Yeah, I totally agree. A lot of my nature journaling is, is just sitting. <laughs> so then I'll do, I'll do obviously put pen to paper later, but there's a lot of sitting involved. <laughs> Yeah, I think it, doing this can grow some really, really conscientious, wonderfully mm. observant people. And that, that translates into other areas of your life as well. It's just yes. Time, taking time for things, giving things a bit of space before you do something. <laughs> yes, a pause before action. Yeah. I'd like to read a quote from your blog post that you created for International Nature Journaling Week. You wrote... When I'm in the field, when walking or sat in meditation, I like to ask the question, what else is here? Think on it for a moment. What else is here? Other than thoughts, other than breath, other than sight, smell, sound, what moves in this moment? And I just love this question and I use it myself. I've taken it from your uh, blog post and I use it in my own journal practice and I just love it. It just resonates with me so deeply i'd love for you to talk about this question how it came to you and how you use it yeah that was quite a good one that one. <laughs> i do i <laughs> use that myself now um <laughs> it came to me because i was i was on a um a buddhist son retreat it's a sort of a, a korean zen style retreat and they ask you in in that tradition to sit with a question what is this mm. what is this and you said what is this and I tried it for a while and I found it far too analytical for me. Um, it, it's not supposed to be. You're supposed to find this profound silence within the question box. Couldn't find that. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't working for me. Um, and so I was actually outside and I was trying to play with the question. And somehow it just morphed into what else is here. I don't, I don't know how mm. that happened precisely, but it kind of it promotes this expansiveness to yeah. me. Where you're sort of just trying to get out of what's going on in there to what's mm. out there. Um, and I, I actually use it when, because I, I do have a bit of anxiety and some issues around anxiety. Um, mm. If I feel myself going into a bit of an anxious cycle, what else is here can help mm. to go, apart from this cycle and the stuff that's going on here, what else is there? Yeah. Um, so I find it really useful in, in so many things, not just the you know the journaling and the art, the artistic stuff, but just in life. Um, mm, I love that to say, yeah. Apart from this feeling that's uncomfortable right now, what else is there? That's beautiful to to use it in in life. I find myself sitting by a clump of grass and say, what else is here? And it, and I just name things, and it doesn't. You don't have to have. It doesn't have to have extra thoughts behind it, but like, yeah, there's a grasshopper here with me. Yeah. There's a flower here with me. 
and it's just so beautiful. I don't even know how to describe it, but it just works for me as well. <laughs> yeah, I hope all people uh, connect with that one. It's just been really, it's nice that people, it's resonated with people. Yeah. Because um, it really has been great for me, that one. Mm. Okay, so now I want to talk about something beautiful that you've just launched into the world. So you have this amazing series of um, artworks inspired by the book Watership Down by Richard Adams. You talked about the book before. And this series you call Lapine Botanica. Is that how you pronounce it, Lapine Botanica? I'm not entirely sure how you pronounce it. I mean, it's it's either lap, Lapine or Lapin. Mm-hmm. Lap, I'm not sure. It's um, Richard Adams in the book. La- mm-hmm. Lapin from the French rabbit, I think. Mm-hmm. Lapin is... It's the name of the language. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, the, the rabbits have this language that they speak, and it's, it's quite beautiful. He's created this, this language of words that matter to rabbits, like dew, danger, um, mm. good food, less good food. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so it's it's from that. It's, so it's a, a little nod mm-hmm. to Richard Adams. Mm-hmm. And... These pieces are just absolutely stunning. So in uh, in the book, the the rabbits have these f- um, plant names, yeah. and you have created these beautiful artworks. And inside each rabbit, it, the shape of each rabbit is a, an amazing, detailed, overlapping, intricate exploration of the plant name that each rabbit has. Yeah. How did you come to this incredible theme? Um, I think I was on holiday one year, and I, I was thinking about um, yeah, I was thinking about the rabbit names, and I'd been on a um, a website of a, a few, probably about a year before that, and I've kept reading all of these depressing comments from children or young people who said that they just didn't connect with the, the book because of all of these plant names. I don't know what the plant oh, is. Oh, interesting. Um, too many plant names was just coming up over and over again. Really? Um, I think these kids have probably been forced to study it at school, so they were set up not to like it. <laughs> this is usually yeah. the way of not liking them. <laughs> um, and I thought, well, that's a shame, you know, that they, they don't have a connection with that plant. Um, mm. But, you know, Richard Adams was such a countryman, and he was so inspired by his landscape in Hampshire that it's a shame that that sort of that connection that he had is somehow being lost. Um so I kind of thought it was a good opportunity, really, to um, to try and reconnect the rabbit with the plant, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Your style is is really unique to you. If I see it, I know it's you. You've got you've always got little details and overlapping things, and I guess this is the Edwardian the Edwardian diary influence coming out. But your style is just so intricate and beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> um, that's really nice to hear. Um, I always used coloured pencils when I was growing up, and then I was sort mm. of told at art school to stop. And I said, don't use pencils, use paints. <laughs> Such a shame. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent several years after that doing paints. Yeah, I'm very glad you ditched that and and went your own way because what you're creating in the world is absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, um, I feel much better not using paint, so I'm going to stick with that. And a lot yeah. of it's funny because a lot of people see those rabbit designs and they say, "Oh, is that watercolor?" No, oh, it's colored pencil. For some reason, mm. people think that it's watercolor. Mm. So I've somehow ended up back in paints and inadvertently <laughs> through a different. <laughs> Maybe route. it's because they're blended so beautifully. I don't know, but yeah, don't they're know. they're super full of color and intricacy and. You have just launched an Etsy store where these beautiful artworks can be accessed. How's yeah, that going? That's that's it's been it's been strange actually because I never I find it a little bit awkward to ask for money for things. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. I, I've got another job where that pays most of the bills, so I don't I don't particularly want to go that route. But mm. it's a way of getting people to see your art, and a lot yeah. of people wouldn't see it if it wasn't. In, on a yep. product that they could buy and, you know unfortunately that's kind of how the way <laughs> the world is yep. um and yeah it's had quite a good reception so far um the rabbit series uh, i've done six of them so far but there's actually going to be 24 plus a few extras oh wow i thought the series was complete i'm so no. excited to see more no, no, no. Oh, there's um that's set number one um, and nice. i'm going to start the next set next month 
So I'm hoping that this it's kind of going to kind of keep on rolling and keep on accumulating. Um, I'll be on Instagram as usual, showing the progress of this this new batch, and hopefully mm. that will you know translate into people seeing the old ones. And I'm I'm hoping to you know to be able to keep it going for quite a while. But uh, it it's kind of unfortunately it's sort of a it's tied into how well it does. Because mm. I just want people to see my work. You know, that, that's the most important thing to me because it has a message that I really want yes. to spread. Yes. Um, and I'm just trying to find ways to get people to see it. <laughs> that's mm. pretty much what all this is about. Tell me about your message. What would you like to share, if you could say it in words? That despite what we might think, we're not separate from the world. Yes. And that it is of value even if you live in the middle of a city and have a high-powered job you still will want eventually somewhere to go to get away from that. Everyone will. Mm. Um, We're in this endless pursuit of something that isn't rooted in the natural world. And I want people to recognise that more, I think, so before we lose it, before we've destroyed the thing that grew us up. Yeah. That's Um, beautiful. Yeah. Alex, thank you so much for talking to me. It's been a joy. It's, I really resonate with the things you do and say and the way that you connect with the world. So thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. It's been fantastic. It's been really good. I hope you've enjoyed this episode with Alex as much as I did. His way of connecting both inwardly and outwardly really resonates with my own way of interacting with nature. Next time you're out with your journal, try asking and answering his question, what else is here, and see what you notice. Please take a look at his work at alexboonart.com and his Etsy store where you'll find his beautiful Watership Down inspired series. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week.